Hello, Rim of the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of the resistance against Mystery Babylon are growing all around the world. This is episode number 349, and I also want to date it today. This is April 26, 2020, and you'll find out why here in a little bit. 2022. 2022. <laughs> Got to get it right if I'm going to date it. <laughs> That's okay. We're, I'm just human. And I'm your host, Dr. Michael Aiken. I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life and the corrector of my speech. Sometimes <laughs> when I get the date wrong, Mary Lou. Hey, everybody. So great to be here today. We're excited. Um, I believe something has shifted in the spirit realm in God's favor, <laughs> in I God's people's favor. Um, I've, I've felt it this whole last week. Um, we've just been on the verge of tears over and over, but that usually comes with when the anointing is present in the presence of the Lord. And um, we're pretty excited. We're yeah. we're making big progress on the building. Um, I think we're going to be getting done sooner than we thought. And then we could, we've got to look at, um, you know, getting the chairs before they're they're out of stock or can't be shipped. Uh, but God will provide a way for that. And I, I think the biggest thing we need everybody to pray about is, is getting the uh, video and PA equipment because um, one of the things that, that we've had, you know, people come and give us bids and stuff, and they said the equipment's getting harder and harder to find. And so what we need for you guys to do is when we're ready for that, just pray that it's there. Yeah. That we're, we're not being told that there's like a six-month wait. Right. Uh, and the things. chairs, too, because yeah, uh, sometimes I'd, I've been looking, and I'll get on a site, and they'll say just so many available. So, yeah. um, but yeah, God's, we, God's we don't gonna, want to go to school. God's going to make a way. We're getting ready to pick out the um, soap dispensers and paper, paper towel dispensers for the restrooms, and I'm going to get those automated kind, guys, where you don't have to touch hardly anything. That's right. <laughs> you know, we could go old school back when uh, – they first started building churches in Rome with Constantine. The preacher got to sit down. Everybody else had to stand up. But we don't want to do that. We want you to be able to <laughs> no, we sit can't. down and enjoy the teaching and be able to take notes when you need to. Uh, guys, and, and I want to tell a little story on us. Uh, the other day we were at, uh, we had to run to Springfield, and so we stopped for breakfast. Mary and I got to talking. And it seemed like everything that we talked about, the, the presence of God was so strong. I was, just, I was sitting there eating my eggs and crying and crying and crying and uh, with different things that we were talking about. And so we finished up and uh, Mary went on out to the car and I went to pay and I'm sitting there trying to pay for breakfast and I got tears rolling down my face and the girls look at me and I just, I said, boy, the pollen's pretty bad this time of year. <laughs> Cause it is like, well, you know, God's moving on me and I'm just crying like a baby, you know, you just, uh, but God, God is doing some things, and uh, yesterday, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm really enjoying doing is going over to the center, and I try to walk an hour a day, and here lately, the way the crew, the, with their schedules and stuff, the different places the contractor has them, Mondays, I just kind of have the place to myself, and uh, yesterday, I was walking and praying, and God told me to, to, to pull up some, uh, listen to some Steve Camp. And as I did, I really started listening to the lyrics, and I thought, oh, Lord, nobody would even tolerate the lyrics today. It, it wouldn't go today because he was calling for repentance. I mean, he was calling things. There was um, one of his uh, songs called The uh, the Great American Novel where he's talking about how we had the uh, the uh, rush to the moon to beat the Russians. And he said, you know, you, you say we beat the Russians to the moon, but we starved the children to do it. it was, it's just like we have lost so much in the body of Christ yeah. that, that so many of our songs are about how God makes us feel, how God does things for us. And uh, there's there, yeah, there is some worship here and there, but it's primarily about making us feel better. And uh, God said, he said, you know, I warned you guys. He said, I had one of my psalmists write a song called Returning to the Heart of Worship, that it's all about me, it's not about you. And he said, in that song, I even had you apologize for what you've done to worship and praise. 
we have we have become so Laodicean in so many of our things that that it's it's we we have turned him into a sugar daddy or something. It's just like it's or a Santa Claus or something. It's always seeking his hands, seeking his hands, seeking his hands. We never seek his face. We never seek his ways. And so I'm I'm praying about all that and and actually thanking God because I see a different heart in the remnant. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me wipe the tears from my eyes so that I can actually read what God gave me. And God started giving me a prophetic word yesterday. And, uh, you know, most of the time, every once in a while, God will give me a prophetic word. And, and, and it's been kind of a rare thing for me. A lot of times it's interwoven into my preaching and my teaching. That God will have me teach on something, there'll be a prophetic edge. Um, I know that I have, I've seen comments uh, on YouTube on some of my older stuff that maybe I taught eight or nine years ago. And people are saying, you know, uh, maybe he didn't realize it, but he's actually describing what's happening today because when you understand end time prophecy and what the elite are doing, uh, you can kind of understand their end game. But God's been giving me prophetic words here lately, and I, I want to read this one. And God has said there have been multiple generations that have been disillusioned with the supernatural nature of the kingdom of God. They have been instructed to shout for miracles, praise for miracles, jump for miracles, and to give sacrificially to release the supernatural power of God. My people have been told to do everything but to repent, realign their hearts, minds, and lives with my word and kingdom, and then to learn to walk in my ways. The awakening of the remnant began with them sensing that something was wrong. My remnant began with repentance and a deep desire to return to my ways, my statutes, and my commandments. The remnant sought my face and my ways. Their petitions to me was to help them rediscover how to walk in my kingdom. Because they have placed me and my kingdom first, I am releasing a new wave of the supernatural to them. They have sought my face, and now I will move my hands in their behalf. As they pray and stand in faith, frozen hearts will melt at the foot of my cross. Prodigal children will, in repentance, return home. Mountains built by the enemy will be decimated before them. Moving in the supernatural has always been entwined with my ways and now it is time for my remnant to learn to both walk in my ways and my power. This move will cross through multiple generations that will walk united because they are holding my hand, being led by my spirit, and walking in my ways. True ministries will not be judged by their splendor or their waves of self-sustainment through the Laodicean spirit. What will mark the ministries of the remnant is the durability and sustainability of the lives and families that they minister to. New Joshua's, Caleb's, and Timothy's will arise within their ranks. Faithfulness will be branded upon their hearts by my spirit. My power will flow through their words and their hands to bring light in my kingdom to those trapped in darkness. Now is the time for my kingdom to be released through my sheer wreath in power and truth. Now, guys, one of the things I'm going to do, now we can't do it on, on our YouTube and Rumble channel because they don't provide us enough space for all the text, but on the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing website, when we post this podcast, I'm going to insert that entire prophetic word uh, into, the, uh, the, uh, into the text so that you guys can print it out. I really believe with all my heart that we are at a pivotal point. And, you know, Mary, I look back at over the, let's say the last 10 years, God has been preparing it. it was, it's not just our ministry. There have been many others that, you know, God had me talk about realigning to the kingdom and changing our hearts and, and returning back to the ways of God. And Mary, God is so gracious he doesn't just spring anything on you. The Bible says that God does nothing unless he first tells the prophets. And the prophet's job, now if it's judgment, the prophet's job is to turn the heart so that prophetic word doesn't come to pass. 
because God's people repent. But the other part of it is when God's prophets begin to speak what God wants to do, it's so that his people can begin to prepare so that they can break up the follow ground of their hearts so that they can realign themselves to the word. You know, I remember years ago, and, and uh, I think it was Dr. Bill Hammond was, was talking about the prophetic, and he says, like, when somebody has a prophetic word of what God's supposed to do uh, through them in ministry and stuff, they just think it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen like ripe cherries falling off a tree. And he said, that's wrong. He says, when God gives you a prophetic word about something, he's showing you the possibilities. He said, then it's your job to become the man or woman who can walk in it. And I thank Mary for the, for the remnant. God has been showing them and preparing them. And there have been so many that hunger to see a move of God. And, but that, that hunger wasn't so they could be entertained, like what, what we, we see today in, in different things. It's they wanted to return to God's ways first. And, and I've got to get close to God. I've, mm-hmm. I've got to return to his ways. I've got to return to publicity. I've got to, I've got the, the, what's, what's going on in churches today is not working. Uh, in fact, my, one of my good friends, Dr. John Gar, uh, sent me a book or sent me a, a post about a book, and it's called A Church of Cowards, uh, written by uh, John Walsh, and I'm getting ready to get it. Uh, but there was an, also an article written about it that basically was describing how American Christianity is destroying Christianity because we have fallen so short of the mark that we have wandered so far away from the word. But Mary, the remnant, they've been going the opposite direction. That's right. How encouraging. <laughs> and because they have put God first, because they have sought God first and his ways, and Mary, they were willing to change anything, mm-hmm. turn their lives upside down, go against the grain. They, they became the, uh, the salmon that uh, were fighting and flowing upstream while everybody else was floating down the stream of, of traditions that, uh, that stem out of the mystery religions. Instead, they were fighting to return back to the Word of God. And, and, and in, in the process, God was working on their hearts. They, they became humble. You know, as, as I was thinking about this this morning, you know, the Bible says that several interesting things about Moses, that Moses, the, the Israel saw the works of God. Moses understood the ways of God. And it said something else about Moses. When God released him into ministry, he was the most humble man on the planet. Mm -hmm. It's humility before God and understanding his ways and learning to walk in biblical holiness are the keys to unlocking the supernatural of the kingdom. We see it in the lives of the apostles. We see it in the lives of the followers in Acts that they that they, they remained humble before God. It, they didn't get lift up in arrogance. There was one time that, you know, God supernaturally healed, and, and it was in a Gentile area, and they thought they were gods, and they immediately said, no, 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 we're not gods. We're just representing the one true God, the, the, the unknown God that you guys have over here that you don't know who he is. He's the only real God, and we're here representing him. And so, guys, God has been working on our hearts for such a time as this. And as he begins to move, we've got to remain humble. We, we have, we've got to remain a teachable spirit because I, I believe that, you know, if you're 80% there and God begins to move, in the moving, if we do it right, God can correct us the other 20% of the way that, that we're always learning uh, we always have to be be correctable before the Lord. We've always got to be willing that if understanding that we don't know it all, none of us do. But God in his graciousness will always give us what we need in the moments. He'll correct us where we need to be correct us. He encourages us where we need to be encouraged. And guys, there's a, there are a lot of prayers, a lot of mountains that I believe that God's getting ready to decimate. Mm-hmm. Not only in America, I mean around the world. It doesn't, doesn't matter where you are. Kids are going to start coming home. Ministries are going to be activated. They have felt like they have been John the Baptist on the backside of the desert, and they have been preaching to scorpions and snakes and, and lizards and bugs, and that's about it. 
And because they have been faithful in a little, God is getting ready to make them faithful over much. That's right. And so uh, we, we've, we've really got to make sure that our hearts are right, that uh, we don't give room for the devil. And we've got to, and I think God is going to begin teaching us how to move in mountain moving faith the right way in the days ahead. And I'm going to let Mary share a couple of things because I could, I could just sit and I could talk about this all day long, but uh, I know God's put some things on her heart that flows right along with us too. Well, when you're talking about moving mountains, that always has the connotation of doing something impossible. Because when you, you know, if you've ever been to the mountains like in Colorado or something like that, these massive mountains are there and, and you'd think, well, there's no way to move something like that. Most of us rock, you know. <laughs> and so, but uh, once you started telling me that, I thought, well, we've got to start coming in line with what God wants to do. He's getting ready to move mountains in people's lives, in nations. And so um, I was thinking about scriptures, you know, that, that say that the impossible is not impossible with God. And I was uh, thinking Jeremiah thirty two seventeen says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. There's nothing that God can't do. It, you know, it's, if you're coming up against an impossible situation, it's very easy to get discouraged. You know, and we haven't seen a lot of the supernatural power of God. Yeah, that's why we have multiple generations that have been discouraged because of we, we've gotten so far off, we have been out of alignment with heaven. We've seen supernatural power from the kingdom of darkness growing and growing. And that's, to me, in, in my mind, when I think of mountains, that's what I've thought is just power, power being released, things being done to build that power. And, you know, when you've got um, large, huge entities that are instructing people what to do to create the power and to do these things, um, you get a lot of people working with that. And Satan's been so um, at work trying to divide the body of Christ. Oh, it does. And, you know, there's such power with agreement. You know, the the people in the occult, and I've, I've told you this before, they may have even been in enemy camps almost, different factions of the occult but i saw them come together and work for a common goal you know they they know how to work together they know what agreement means they know that power can be built in that either in the kingdom of darkness and especially in the kingdom of god because you know one can set a thousand to flight two can set ten thousand and so we've got a already a um, precedence in the word that tells us how important that 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 is and my you know i've had a little trouble about the agreement thing because i've met so many people that I thought, I can't come into agreement with what they're doing, <laughs> you know, and you can't. You come no. into agreement with, with something that, that you feel in your heart is wrong. Uh, but, but like you said, like this prophetic word God gave you, it says that, that they're going to be coming together. Yeah, and, because and they're see holding you, his hand. That's it. If It's all about if, if you're looking for what he wants, we all should be flowing together. Oh, absolutely. You know, but, but we've been taught to be self-centered. Yeah, and so it's so hard to guys. We even do that in church meetings. And this, uh, how many church splits have we seen, and and different things when you have board meetings because everybody's fighting for what they want, when nobody ever taught them that whenever you're meeting like that, the the church is a theocracy. It's not a democracy. But when you're voting on things, God holds you accountable for what you vote for, and you better make sure that you're voting for what He wants rather than what you want. That's right. And I, I do think God's doing that um, all over the world, but I think specifically in the United States about bringing people um, out of this mindset that you that your Christian life is separated from politics. And it, and it is a, a yucky process. There's no doubt about that, and there's been so many horrible things done. But they make laws. We have to start voting for, for people that will stand and say, you know, this is one nation under God, that have a fear of the Lord, that, that um, you can tell are sensitive to the moving of God and what God wants. Oh, if yeah. you don't have that, you're going to be in one miserable state just like we are right now. This is the result of people being lackadaisical about issues and not voting 
and just saying, oh, there's no sense. And it, you can't do that. Yeah, separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. It was, it was made up by a, a Masonic-laden Supreme Court, the whole concept, that what the Constitution says is separation of the state and keeping its nose out of the business of the church is what's in the Constitution. And, guys, it is very Greco-Roman to compartmentalize your ministry. Ever, I've heard businessmen men say, you know, church is church and business is business. Well, then you're not walking out your faith. Because Hebraically, everything is intertwined. If your faith does not permeate every aspect of your life, then you're not walking with God the way you're supposed to. And we've got to get grounded in the truth of the word that nothing is impossible with God. In Luke one thirty seven, it says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. And that's when the angel was talking to Mary. And can you imagine that? You know, an angel standing there telling you you're a virgin and you're going to bring forth a, a child. I mean, that you talk about uh, hard to come to grips with. <laughs> and I, I love Mary. She didn't, she didn't question um, the motives of God or anything else. She just basically said, okay, how's this going to work? <laughs> and which is, which is I, I think, the proper way of, of when you get into a situation and God tells you to do something, I think the, the heart of Mary is the way to approach things. I'm not questioning what you want to do. I'm not questioning why you want to do. Of course, they had a messianic expectation. They knew from the prophets that an, an Alma with a mim sofit in the middle. And guys, when, this is one of the things the rabbis uh, will not tell you about. Whenever it says, behold, a virgin shall give forth. They say, well, that's this Alma, which means can be a virtuous woman. The prophet knew exactly what they were going to do with that. He put a mim sofit in the middle of Alma. And anybody that knows Hebrew grammar, you don't do that. Mem sofits only go at the end of the word, but a mem sofit means a closed womb. Mm. So that there could be absolutely no, no possibility <laughs> yeah. that it was going to be a virgin. That's right. So I just, I just wanted to throw that in since we were bringing that up. Well, the story in Matthew, um, it's 17, I took 14 through 20, and it says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic, and sore vexed, for oft times he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. The child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. And notice that he called them a faithless and perverse generation. And what did God, what did we talk about last time? That generation X, Y, and Z, God was, said, Rename them faithful generations. That's right. So as Jesus was walking and teaching on the earth, they were a faithless and perverse generation, and that's where we are right now. Yeah, we are. But because the power of Jesus' name is getting ready to be so across the board, they're going to be known as faithful generations. And, you know, I was in, back in Jesus' Stacy, that would have been absolutely impossible to think that, that that child could be cured. He's a lunatic, so I'm sure, you know, running around, acting crazy, falling into the fire. Um but the name of Jesus is so powerful. And think about that in connection to where we are today. And, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, mind control. And I tell you, when I first started looking at this and, you know, dealing with my own stuff, and, and I started reading the material that said how they did this and what they'd done, it was so discouraging to me, but what rose up in my spirit was God can undo anything the devil has done. Absolutely. There was a, a movie that they used in programming called Crawl, and we watched that decades ago. It's an older movie, science fiction movie, about um, a princess that gets caught in a mountain where there's a, an evil alien or something that guards it. And when they would try to do anything, this mountain would disappear and reappear somewhere else. 
And you know, I, I saw that even before I read about all that, I saw that in the people that I was praying with. You'd, you'd see a demon manifest, and, and you're, you're taught, okay, in the name of Jesus, come out. And it would smile and leave. And yeah. I thought, now how does, that, how does that correspond with what we're taught in the Word? But what, what I found out as time went on, one of the number one things that you have to pray with someone that's a victim of mind control and has been programmed is you have to command everything to be still. You forbid movement in the name of Jesus because that's what they used. They, they pre-planned, you know, okay, they're going to be people that are going to try to deliver them. And so what can we do that they can never be delivered, they can never be set free? We're going to move things. We're going to yeah. move, move, we're going to shift things. And then, then there will never be at the point. Uh, I remember when I heard uh, God tell me, he said, you, um, he said, get them in this, in this place, like stop the movement, get them in that place. And he said, the angels will be there to help in, in deliverance. Yeah. And they, and I think that what they did is they, they <sighs> created realms and all these things that, um, well, you know, in mind control, God's angels are not going to mess with your head. No. So there, there are things that God's angels are not going to do because I believe God prohibited them from certain things. But the fallen angels that's, don't, that's don't, apply, don't apply to, to those rules. Oh, that's their and playground so, right so there. And so they mess with the mind. And, and I remember that was such a huge um, piece of information to command everything to be still. And, and I know... Um, I mean, they were working on this with me when I was in middle school because my um, science project was on a perpetual pendulum. <laughs> and do you know that that's in programming? A perpetual pendulum that continually swings, continually swings. And so you can see how they've, they've not only done this with mind control, but they've done things to reinforce it in the natural to where you see it, that you put it in front of your eyes, you see it, and it gets imprinted in your mind. So you think, you know, instead of looking at this, and I mean, those thoughts would come to me like, well, this looks impossible. This looks impossible. How are you ever going to get somebody free? But God would just, and I'm not, I'm not even called to do this as a ministry. God was just showing me how this worked for, you know, first of all, so for I could get sake. free. Yeah. But then to help the people that were already there, um, I didn't go looking for victims. They came to me, and, you know, you had to do something. And so I was just praying, fasting, praying, asking God to show me what to do. And uh, I, you can't get them delivered unless you command all movement to stop in Jesus' name. That's, that's one of the principles. And then um, there was also something that I noticed, that sometimes what you were talking to was something too big to be inside a person. And it wasn't a matter of coming out bringing it out the front it was pushing it pushing its influence its tentacles out the back and closing the door so they can't they have no more access so things like that you don't read in a deliverance manual no but see god has the answer to everything and nothing's impossible with god they thought this thing was sewed up with the mind control and not only on the people that have had uh, trauma done to them but they've mastered mind control over the masses they have. That's why they weren't, I don't think they've ever been worried about any of the elections for years because uh, besides the corruption that's going on, all they had to do is just mesmerize the public, you oh, know, the, and they could, they could ensure somebody gets in there that's evil. Well, just the bias in the media is to the place of, of being ridiculous. And uh, then it has become so obvious that a, a blind man can see it. Guys, we, we need to understand that both Moses and Jesus are the keys to walking in the supernatural power of God. Moses did exactly what God told him to do when God told him to do it, whether he wanted to do it or not. He didn't want to go down and face Pharaoh. God told him to do it. Okay, I'll go do it. The only time in Moses' life where he stepped out of that, he got so aggravated. You know, I can't, Mary, I can't imagine pastoring you know, millions of people out in the desert that 
that all did they griped about this, they griped about that. They brought Egypt with them. Well, they did. <laughs> had to battle that. And they and they and for the first time they were free enough to gripe. And boy, they, they made up for hundreds of years of slavery by mm-hmm. by griping. And he got so frustrated that he struck the rock the second time. But you know, Moses said, Listen, there's gonna be one that comes just like me. That he's only going to he is only going to speak the words that God gives him. He's only going to do the things that God gives him. Now I have been told by those in in, in that narrative that are that um, are basically above my pay grade in being able to read Hebrew that they are fluent and they understand the ebbs and flows. That there's a changeover, in what Moses was saying. He said, you know, first of all, they're going to come just like me. He's going to, the Messiah is going to be just like me. But in that narrative, there's a switch over where he begins speaking for God. And God says, he's going to be just like me. Because Messiah is Yahweh come in the flesh. And one of the things Jesus over and over and over again said, I have only come to do the will of the Father. I will not speak anything unless he speaks it. I will not do anything unless I first see him doing it. And I, I think of a situation in Jesus' life. He had, he had just been told that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded by evil Herod. And he goes off to be alone. Can anybody blame him? Okay, he's mourning. Jesus said that he was the greatest prophet that had ever lived in Israel. He was the greatest prophet that Israel had ever produced, and he was family. And he's going off to mourn and just to get in. Anybody would do that, guys. If you had someone close to you that had been murdered, wouldn't you get a little and and just pray through some issues and stuff? So... He's doing that, but in the distance, he could see all these people and all the needs. And Mary, what he saw was the Father said, minister to them. Mm -hmm. And the Bible said that he was moved with compassion. It overrode his own need. It overrode his own needs to where he saw the Father said, go meet their needs, go move now. Set aside your mourning, set aside your grief, and go minister to the people now. Mm -hmm. That's one of the secrets is when God says move, move. When God says, when God isn't moving, we ought to have the grace just to set out. It's It's never about pleasing people. It's never about pleasing crowds. You know, I had uh, Dr. Mary Ann Brown, and, and she was just such a precious woman of God and, and very, very prophetic. And one day she told me we were talking, she said, in, in, she, she loves to move in the prophetic. She said, you know, there's been uh, ministries that I, 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 because of what they did, I could not move in the prophetic. He said, when you're promised money for every prophetic word that you give, she said, God said, preach the word, sit down, mm-hmm. and hush up. Be silent. Because they've merchandised yeah. the anointing. Yeah, they did. Oh, how awful. And, and we, we've, we've done stuff like that in churches or, or promised a prophetic word for somebody that gave so much money and stuff. Guys, all this stuff needs to stop. It's, not, it's never about pleasing the people. It's not about building a ministry. It's about doing the will of God. And that's what's going to be the heart of the remnant is to do the will of God. You know, there were, there were, there were you know, times in Jesus' life that he went and healed somebody and just left. And it's like, you know, it's like one of those long ranger moments. Who was that masked man? I don't know, but I just know that I was blind and now I see kind of thing. That It was just simply God says, you know, when he went to the pool of Bethesda, Everybody there was sick. Everybody there was infirm. They were there waiting for the stirring of the waters. Mary, he walked in, healed one man who had nobody to help, had nobody to help. Maybe everybody else had people that helped. Nobody to help and just walked away. And it wasn't later. It was like later on that the guy found out, if I remember the story, found out who he was. Guys, that's, that's the way the kingdom works. It's about obeying the king, representing the king. 
Well, and I think I think this is one of the first times in so many decades we're getting ready to see such a major outpouring of God's Spirit. Yes, that I think I, that there are going to be people that walk into places and just speak the name of Jesus, and there's just going to be a holy hush fall on that place. Yes, I mean we're getting ready to see things that we've only dreamed of, because God's got a plan, and and it's taken Him all this time to get the remnant to the place because you can't you can't just start going into places where high level demonic activity is and start disrupting the kingdom of darkness without retaliation so you have to know okay have i got my doors covered is there anything in my life that they're going to whip around and come after me or my family because that's that's a lot of why we had to walk the route that we walked is we didn't have a clue about this stuff Absolutely, and you know, there's been people that have done mighty things uh, in the for for God, but then you'll you'll hear, and they've died of cancer. They've and and so we God's preparing the remnant not only to to flow with His move, but to be able to be sustained through it. Yeah, that's that's the the power of walking in the commandments, of mm-hmm. walking in the ways of God, because you're closing all the doors to the enemy. And I think a lot of times. Uh, I even take a John Alexander Dowie, okay? He started out um, really well. He understood, like the back in the, the turn of the 20th century, he understood that cigarettes cause cancer. And so he would, he was, I mean, he was casting out spirits and nicotine and everything else. Uh, and uh, Mary, he, he, he was moving so powerful in God that in Chicago, even the mob was afraid to go after him. They just, they just shut up and they feared him. But it was people that got him off. And because people got him off, the enemy was able to kill him in a car accident. Well, I think that it would be easy for somebody that had a prophetic gift to get off if you let the people demand. Um, that's one of the things that you can't do if you've got a prophetic gift is is feel like you have to have a word all the time or you have to have... Um, the main thing you got to do is just seek God. You say yeah. what He tells you when He tells you to say it, and and but you can't you can't get in that mode of operation because boy, it'll the enemy will slide right in on you. Well, I, th- I think part of it is we have lost an understanding of what a biblically of what a navi a prophet's supposed to be. They will have prophetic words, but they were Bible teachers, and so we have a lot of people that are prophets right now that couldn't teach their way out of a wet paper sack because they've never been taught that. They've never developed that gift. And Hebraically, uh, when you wanted really deep teachings from the Word that really represented the heart of God, I mean that just stirred you down to your very bones. It was a Navi. It was a prophet because they could they could prophetically understand the heart of God in the Scriptures, mm-hmm. and they could bring it to life. And, and we've, we've lost sight of that. We've just, because the prophetic words are exciting, but sometimes in-depth Bible teaching gets up in your business. It, it convicts your soul. It, 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 makes you, it causes you to want to change, which is really a major uh, task of a prophet is to say, listen, not only is there a, a gap in the hedge of protection, here's how you took it down, and here's how you restore it by teaching the Word. And I think that's part of us understanding that our, our, our biblically of, of how to do things and what our giftings are supposed to be. But Mary, one thing, and remember back the very first, we only had one of these years ago back when we were in Marshfield. We had the, the conference where we had a graduation and stuff, and we had Brother Looper and some others come, and I taught on biblical counsels. I think we're on the, the verge of seeing that happen. And, and what God gave me the vision of is you have those in the fivefold ministry gathered around a council table and saying, listen, what does God want? What, what is God speaking in this hour? Is there something that he needs done? And the first thing that we find, it's almost like in, in the book, because I, I see the book of Judges and the book of Acts coming together as one. Okay, now which one of our ministries is gifted in this area? Because you, not, you know, it's, a, it's like everything doesn't have to be biblical life or everything doesn't have to be this other ministry or whatever. It's, 
okay, now we have come into unity by, by prophetic words and, and God speaking to us about what God needs to have done. Which ministry is gifted in this to head it up? And now once we establish that, what can our ministries give in support to bring the vision to pass? Oh, that's, that's wonderful. So that there's, there's no one general. It's like when God raises up a general for this fight, he raises him up. We give him the support. When he gets that, he sets back down. What's the next thing that's yeah. going on? And, okay, God's going to raise up somebody else because there's only one king, and his name is Jesus. And we need to have the spiritual maturity to understand when God is anointing somebody for something that he's doing, that there's a now moment. And then we can lend our support to it and then wait for the next battle because he may raise up another judge. Yeah. I love that though. The, that working together atmosphere. And uh, we've, we've not seen that in any of the churches that we've been in, but, but God's going to bring it. Yeah. I, I, know I think it'll, I think it'll be, uh, and I, I've got a conference table setting in my office over in Diggins just for that very thing. And I, I think it's not just going to be local. I think there's going to be national things that God wants to do that, mm-hmm. that uh, certain ministries will be gifted in certain areas. And God is saying, this is what I want to do now. I'm going to do it through Apostle John over here. And so I'm going to raise him up. I'm going to anoint him. He already has some of the talent. He needs resources. Provide him the resources. Keep him backed up in prayer and keep your intercessors, have that whole ministry covered in prayer until that thing is done. Yeah, the co- prayer coverage is huge too. We've got something we've got to be praying about too that I don't want to get off the podcast without mentioning it is there's been an attack on food facilities. Yes. And that even. Um, it's went what the to enemy's doing. As your standard, which is one of the um, companies that you can order bulk food from and they bring it on trucks and everybody gathers and. And unloads it, and and uh, they had their headquarters burned down. And I don't think it's been listed as arson or anything, but there was the one facility. I think it was a potato factory or something that a plane crashed into and burned it down, and the pilot died. and And I thought, you know, I thought years ago when that plane came to crash into to our house, I've wondered so much about how that works. And I, I think more than likely it was someone that was a program multiple that was a pilot. Um, and God snapped them back to reality at the last minute, man. And yeah, and that because they came so close, and then just went back up, you know. But I thought I thought about that when I heard about that facility. I thought that may have been a program multiple, and and he just flew the thing in there. It was assigned to fly it in there, and so we've got to be praying over the food facilities because there, there's no doubt this is part of the effort to cause a food crisis. They want to control the masses by controlling the food. Right, and so there's too many there to be coincidence that that are being attacked. So we really need to keep that in prayer. I personally believe that there's going to be places across the United States where there's such an abundance of food that it gets shipped out. I think this is going to be one of those places. We've got an abundance of rain. Um, I, I think God's going to have an abundance of food here and other places to where the shortages are, we can ship things out. And that you guys be praying about that with me. Um, we have Beltane also coming up May the 1st, and we got new listeners. So I'll just mention this again. If you, if, as a child, if you were ever put in uh, winding the Maypole ceremony on May Day, that's from paganism it's druidism the pole represents a phallic symbol the going in the circle represents a female and it's a ritual that is druidic in nature so if you've been put in that you think well i was a little child satan couldn't do anything with that i was innocent he he doesn't play fair he's a legalist and so so because you were in that you need to ask god to forgive every sin connected to it and uh, to break any curses break any assignments of any spirits that have have come to you because of that and command him to go in Jesus' name. And also, um, I talked to somebody years ago that had, um, I think their uncle was in Freemasonry, and, and I don't know what exactly it was, but they had her come and dress up, and she was in some kind of a of a ritual. I don't think they would have called it a ritual, but something that they, they brought the kids in and had them do things. They and would probably she, just call it a reenactment or something. And they said, and I remember them saying, well, God, um, Satan can't do anything with that. You're, you're just a little child. You're not well. He can. Any any time you're yoked to anything that is as an occult origin, then he can use that. Yeah. So so those are the type of things. I mean, we've went over no telling how many of them, but those are the type of things 
that need to be broken before you would ever step out yeah. into spiritual warfare because because this is um this is going to be a war that can be easily won by the remnant yes you can you can walk into a situation and totally break the plan and scheme of the enemy by speaking the name of Jesus because he came to destroy the works of the wicked one, and it will totally destroy um, the plan. It'll, it'll just make it fall and fail. And, and what you'll have left is a bunch of people that were being used and affected that just kind of stand and look yeah. and staring off in the distance. And so I think that's going to happen a lot. You know, another thing that we need to bring up at this time Pray for the protection of the children. Beltane and Halloween, they're, they're what yeah. are known as Axis uh, ritual holidays. In fact, what's interesting is when they're celebrating Beltane in the Northern Hemisphere, they're yeah. cel- celebrating Halloween in the, hem- in the Sound, southern, yeah. southern Hemisphere. Both of these holidays require a child right. sacrifice. They do. And so we need to be praying that God would protect the children and for, and forbid them to have their sacrifice mm-hmm. this time. And there's a, there are a lot of uh, celebrations around May Day that there's there's probably not a sacrifice, but there's all kinds of naked dancing and things like that. And that builds power too. Yeah, it does. And so we just need to be praying. And you'll usually feel an agitation around that day simply because there is such a building of occultic power that there will be pressure that you can feel. And so as we all pray and ask God to just go ahead of every occult person and forgive every sin that uh, they're gaining power from, see, it's, it's kind of like a, an ocean wave that comes after Easter um, because you've got all the people that are fasting up until Easter, which is weeping for Tammuz. Yep. And then you go into Beltane, and you've got all the Easter eggs that have been had, all this occult activity that most people don't even know there's anything wrong with, but... But across the nation, can you imagine how many Easter egg hunts there have been and Easter bunnies? Um, it's just it's just hard to fathom. <laughs> you know, one of the things Satan counts on and, and is error brought in and left long enough becomes a tradition. And men will fight with everything within them to maintain their traditions not even questioning the origin. And so one of the things that we have stressed, that's why we call ourselves, you know, biblical life. If it's in the Bible and it's clear and it's been hermeneutically established that this is the will of God, we ought to be doing it. If it's not in the Bible, to even include certain signs and wonders and different things that we've had a lot of things passed off in the charismatic movement as signs and wonders that very possibly were demonic manifestations if it's not in the Bible, how about let's just not do it? Let's just, let's just stick with the written word of God. Because the Bible says that even all the Old Testament stories, not only their moral lessons and understanding how God moves, the Bible says they were all given for our example so that we could see how God moved. We could see things that God judges so that we could say, I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to follow the way of 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 the northern tribes i'm not gonna i'm gonna i'm I'm not going to create golden calves i'm not going to do all these things i'm going to stay faithful to the ways of god i'm going to stay faithful to jesus you see the true remnant only bow the knee to jesus they will they will fight for the true jesus they will they will come against the gates of hell itself Mm -hmm. for jesus they will never deny him. They will never lie about him. They will not try to make him into an idol that accommodates their flesh. They will declare the biblical Jesus, that he is their king, he is their Lord, he is their savior, and they will fight for him, and they will never bow the knee to the son of perdition. They will never accept mystery of Babylon garbage, but they will, but they will in humility and in kindness, this is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, listen, even if somebody is erring and stuff and they're all in strife and everything, you got to, with meekness, correct them. Because, you know, how long did it, this, this is the way that Mike Lake reads this, how long did it take for God to get the truth through your old thick head? Okay. And 
if it took him that long for you, it's going to take that long for other people too. And so with meekness and kindness, you instruct mm-hmm. and you, and, and you teach them to try and you, you're praying for them and you're fasting for them to bring them back to, to, to the word of God if they get off. And the key is, is do it in love because Absolutely. it's love for somebody that you're, you're trying to get them out of harm's way. You know what, you know, when you look at when the apostle Paul in the book of Romans said, love fulfills the law, look it up. Get get out your strong skin coordinates if you have a good Bible program. Look up that Greek word. It doesn't mean to be fulfilled like a like a contract. It paints a picture for us, and it's it. Paul used such a neat word because it is it is the word used when you have a ship that is fully staffed and fully loaded with goods. Okay, so you know, imagine you know we we're looking today with with the with the shortage. Every time I see a trucker, you know, it used to be when I see truckers on the road, it's like they're in my way and you got a solid wall of them and you can't get around them and stuff. And and anymore, I praise God for every trucker yes. that I see. You want to toot your horn and say, uh, go, guy. Toot your horn. <laughs> you know, if you guys pull over, I'll buy you a burger at McDonald's. Come on, guys. You know, Bobby was like, ship that toilet paper, ship that toilet paper. <laughs> uh, but imagine in the ancient world that – your community was so dependent upon ships coming in and bringing spices and food and all these things that communities would celebrate when a merchant ship would come in because now it's like we were, you know, we're, we're getting steak instead of beans and cornbread type of thing. And, and we're going to be able to have all these things. And, and the, sometimes it was almost a, if like there had been bad storms, that community, sometimes you, you read in history that that community was almost at the point of starvation. And they would look at the horizon and there would be a ship coming and they're saying, we're going to survive. We're going to survive. We're going to survive. And it comes in laden with everything that they need, and it's fully staffed so it can be unloaded. That's what love does to the commandments of God. That's right. And we're, we're getting ready to see those kind of miracles manifest because when God gives you an assignment, he provides everything you need. Yes, provides everything that you need. And I even believe there was a... A guy named Ted Decker, I think he's gone on to be with the Lord, uh, Tom Decker, the, the the guy we saw up at. And he said he, and of course he's ministered a lot in third world countries. And he said in the days ahead, he said there's going to be places where there's absolutely no food. But he said they, they've learned to walk with God. And he said they will bow their, their, their heads and pray over an empty table. And when they open their eyes, the food they need is mm-hmm. going to be there. I, I believe that we're going to see supernatural things too. like that. I do too, and that's why we've got to we've got to practice now. Yeah, believing for that kind of miracle, yeah. and not just end up with it and then try to muster faith. We can, you know, for years, um, I've had faith that God can do anything because I've seen Him do it. I've seen Him do it, and you know, we were not everybody we we'll walk down that road we walked, and thank God, I hope nobody has to. But boy, did we see the miracle-working power of God. We have. And so, so it's not hard to extend that into everything. And, you know, and when, when, I, when I share things like this, guys, it's not just for us here in America. Yeah, it's for okay. the world. Well, uh, I, there, are, there, are, there are many third-world countries that I know that are listening to this podcast that uh, it is so easy for the New World Order to cut off everything. Right. And I mean, even in the good times, uh, what we would consider uh, skimpy, skimpy supplies here in America, they would consider the biggest yes, bounty they true. ever seen in their lives. Guys, the, the poorest of us here in America are wealthy compared to a lot of people in other nations. And I'm expecting for the lives of the believers, for them to begin experiencing supernatural provision, supernatural right. protection like never before. That's right. And it might, you know, you can have a, a wrong pride in being an American. Yes. Uh, because what's, what's here um, has only been blessed by God because of, of early things that happened. You know, like when, when they 
they came over and actually wanted this to be a place to be free to worship God. That was a covenant that God has sustained us many times. Oh, absolutely. And, and it's, not, it's, it's not anything that people should take for granted because once that covenant's broken, then supplies can be cut off easily. You know, that's why God, God's going to have to raise up his remnant because we're, we're at the point of judgment over all the gross sins. And so the only way that can be mitigated, the only way that we can see things turned around for God's purposes is we've got to stand. And we've got to, um, you know, there's people all the time pushing this war, Mike. I'll yes. hear it. They'll say, say, well, he, the Biden should do this or that. And I'm thinking, I think he's already done, done too much. What I think we should be doing is we should be sending aid to, to those that need it. But they're pushing for a nuclear war. And, and I, I don't think it's God's will that we have a nuclear war. I don't think it's time for the end when fire is going to destroy everything. God doesn't want, want that right now. And, and he doesn't want a nuclear war that's just going to destroy his creation and grounds. And, and I, I think, and this, this is just my own analysis of the situation, number one, I don't think we know everything that's going on. I know we there. don't. We're, we're not being told the truth. Second... I think it's within our government, it's proponents of those that are in league with China personally that want the nuclear war because it leaves China as the world power because America and Russia both will be greatly, greatly weakened. And most of Europe, if it comes to that, well, we, they, we, we need to pray that everything hidden be revealed and that God brings peace to the region and to protect the innocent. The, just the fact of how much wheat comes from Ukraine. See, that would tie into all the big agenda of taking out the food. Oh, I mean, this is all an orchestrated thing. And that's that's what my thought is. Let's help those that need help, and let's stand against this craziness. Mm -hmm. Let's stand against the agenda, and let's say, God, you're greater than this. And if you've got to, to remove leaders, if whatever you've got to do, you can do it. And I come into agreement with God's plan. Oh, Absolutely. And, uh, Father, we just ask right now that all the children, Father, that you would supernaturally yes, protect. Lord. And, Father, do not let this be a way of the masking, grabbing up kids for child trafficking and all the, and all the den of war. Father, we bind that up in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask that heaven would mark every child and make sure that they never get yes. lost in the shuffle. Yes. And, Father, let the fear of God come on those yes. that are child traffickers. And, Father, let them be caught in their own nets. Let them be caught in their own ways. And, Father, let them come to justice, your divine justice, Father. Guys, we're, we're on the, this, this, is, this is a time, I think, that when we pray, not only are we going to see, and man, we're already starting to hear one of the reports of prodigal kids coming home or uh, one of our close friends there, a knot had disappeared off her foot and, and she asked her husband, I wonder where it went. He says, I don't know. I don't have it. But <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're seeing miracles and stuff. But, guys, we're going to enter into a time that when the remnant pray in unison, nations are going to change. Mm -hmm. You see, I think, you know, we, we, have, we have been involved in a government, you know, that has a CI that has done a lot of regime changes in different nations that because they thought it would be more pro-American. I think heaven's getting ready to do some regime changes to make them more pro-kingdom of God. That's what the point is. <laughs> it's about and kingdom. It's, it's not about... It's, it's about kingdom. And guys, when we pray in agreement, because we're centered up on what God wants, it scares the hell out of hell. Mm -hmm. And it makes demons tremble. It makes principalities back off mm -hmm. because they begin losing power and they see decades of work crumble before their very eyes. They've already, we've already seen principalities fall in areas. Mm -hmm. And so we just, we've got to keep standing. We've got to claim the territory for Jesus and, and nothing else for Jesus. You know, the, the thing that I've always felt about the America is that it was just a tool in God's hand. Yes. And, and, you know, we've always kidded before, the only reason we'd ever need an airplane is if God wants to stock it full of food and, and 
get us to take it overseas to hungry people or something. That's the only reason we sure wouldn't need it for traveling. No. And guys, we're 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 in a time of the supernatural. And the words that need to echo in our heart are the words of John the Baptist. For him to increase, I must decrease. Let us always remain humble before God. Never give place to an Antichrist spirit, a Jezebel spirit, or any of these other spirits that like to puff up in pride and everything else. If God moves, he moves. If God is staying still, then we stay still. I had a friend that uh, went on to be with the Lord, and people misunderstood what he said, but he said, listen, he said, my greatest desire is to become a puppet in the hands of God. I want him to move every aspect mm-hmm. of me. Well, then we do it right. <laughs> then we do it right. And guys, that's the heart of the remnant. I don't care who knows my name. All I care is about them knowing his name. The name that is above every name. That he is king of kings and lord of lords. That's and right. he's coming back. He's coming back for a people that are faithful. Now, Father, over every remnant member, Father, I ask that you would disposition us to the place to where the Holy Spirit could uh, emblaze on our hearts faithful. Faithful to our King, Father. Give us a heart for Jesus. Give us a heart for the Word. Give us a heart for lost souls. Give us a heart to do the will of the King in the earth, in our generation, we ask. In Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual, you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the kingdom of God in the Bible, and who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abram. The reality of the Principality's wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end-time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The kingdom priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com.
This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store dot biblical dash life dot com that's store dot biblical dash life dot com